on the phone. It's a pleasure to welcome to the program after literally weeks of uh, of scheduling snafus and whatnot. Um, the author of Kill Anything That Moves, The Real American War in Vietnam, uh, Nick Terse. Welcome to the program, Nick. Thanks very much for having me on. Uh, your your book has gotten uh, incredible acclaim and well-deserved. Um, let's... Uh, I want to start uh, with the story of, of how you came to write this book, um, but l- but before we get to that, um, uh, kill anything. Well, let's let's start with that. How did you um, how how did you come to write this this book? You know, I really stumbled upon this topic. I was uh, I was a graduate student at the time, and I was working on a project on post traumatic stress disorder among U.S. Vietnam veterans. And I used to go down to the National Archives, and uh, I was trying to find uh, basically hard data, uh, you know, uh, official military reports to match up with uh, self-report material, basically what veterans had told us about their, their service, when and where they served in Vietnam, what they were doing at the time. And on, on one of these frequent trips, uh, I had struck out in every research avenue that I pursued. Uh, and at the end of two weeks, I was, it was my last day there, I went to an archivist that I normally worked with, and I told him that I couldn't go back to my boss empty-handed. I needed something, you know, at least a lead uh, to bring back. And he thought about it for, uh, for a couple moments, and then he, he said a few words to me that really changed my life. He asked me if I thought that uh, uh, witnessing war crimes could cause post-traumatic stress. And I told him I thought that was an excellent hypothesis, and I asked what he had on war crimes. And within an hour, I was uh, searching through box after box, thousands upon thousands of pages of reports about massacres, murders, rape, torture, assault, mutilation. It was a, a, a catalog of, of horrors. And uh, I, I realized very quickly that, uh, that these documents uh, from, from uh, a secret Pentagon task force called the Vietnam War Crimes Working Group, I realized that they weren't in the literature anywhere. And uh, you know, I, I decided that I, I wanted to work with them. And, uh, and and that's really what set me off on the, the path that led to kill anything that moves. I mean, that's that that is you know what what people have hailed as, as your book being so important. I mean, you know, and uh, we keep I keep hearing. Uh, I mean, I've uh, read a couple of interviews and, and, and seen some interviews with you, and uh, the, the number I guess there's about thirty thousand books that have been written on Vietnam, and it is uh, it's a stunning accomplishment to. Uh, 30 years later, 40 years later, uh, write a book that actually explains something new and so um, so profound about the war as yours. What and and it is centered around that that notion of uh, that these atrocities were not one-offs, as we as we sort of have been under the. Um, uh, the mistaken assumption, but that this there is something not quite sy- systemic, but w- we'll get to that. But uh, but but how is it that I mean, how is it that that uh, the Vietnam War Crimes Working Group? I mean, that all of that information was sitting there and no one had ever looked at it. Was it because this archivist had offered it to you in a way that nobody else had been offered? I mean, it's it just it's stunning. It, it stunned me, too, and I, I asked him, uh, you know, who's, who's worked with these documents? And he told me that people had looked at one or two cases, but never at the, the full collection at that time. So, uh, you know, I, I think, I think one, one reason for this was the fact that the, the task force was kept secret during the war. It was op- operated unofficially out of the Pentagon, out of the Army Chief of Staff's office. So it really wasn't on the books in some way. So when these records were declassified by the Army... And I think, I think possibly mistakenly, it was just a mass declassification. Uh, you know, no one really was uh, new to look for them, so they just they just sat in the archives. And uh, and then, you know, I, I just happened to, uh, you know, I was I was lucky enough that the the archivist pointed uh, pointed me towards them. And, and and so let's let's talk about the the title of your book because um, the your your stories of or the stories that you've captured uh, uh you know from the archives and from um, uh, hundreds of interviews um the the phrase kill anything that moves uh came up time and time again in one iteration or another on the ground in terms of what uh the orders were for specific um 
um, uh, for specific platoons and for for the uh, military personnel on the ground. But in, in some ways, it also was could be a description of, in fact, what the sort of the the broad strategic goals of of the war itself were. Um, before we get to that sort of that that aspect of it, tell us the story of of Jamie Hendry, who was a, a medic, where you first came across the the use of that phrase. Sure, you know Jamie. Uh, he he really uh, affected my life. I found him first in the in those Vietnam War Crimes Working Group records. I read about him, and then I I went and and tracked him down and, and met him in person. And uh, Jamie was, uh, before the war, a self-described hippie living in, uh, in San Francisco's Haight-Ashbury district. Uh, but he was drafted, and he became a medic, and, and a very good one. He saved a lot of American lives, and the men who served with him said that he was one of the finest soldiers that they'd, uh, that they'd come across. Uh, but Jamie was really shocked by what he saw going on in Vietnam. On his first day in the field, uh, he told me that he, he watched the point man, the lean man of his patrol, uh, detain a young girl and molester right out on a trail. And he thought to himself, my God, what's going on here? And over the ensuing months, he just watched a litany of atrocities take place. A young boy who was uh, detained and beaten and executed for no reason, an old man who was used for target practice, a prisoner who was beaten up and thrown off a cliff. Uh, There was a man who was held down to be run over by an armored personnel carrier, basically a small tank. Uh, and, and Jamie watched all this, but when he spoke up about the brutality, his life was threatened by other members of his unit. And even his friends uh, came up to him afterwards and, and told him, look, you, you need to keep your mouth shut, or you're going to get shot in the back during a firefight, and no one's going to be the wiser. So Jamie did keep his mouth shut, but he kept his eyes open, and he kept cataloging everything that he saw, including... Uh, you know, this culminated really in, in a February 8th, 1968 incident. His unit pulled into a small hamlet, and, uh, and they rounded up all the, the people there, which was about 19 women and children. And Jamie was taking a break, smoking a cigarette, and, uh, and he heard the commanding officer uh, and, a, and a subordinate officer on the radio. And, uh, and a, a lieutenant asked, uh, what should I do with these civilians? And uh, the officer, the captain, West Point train captain, answered, uh, you know the orders that came down from uh, higher this morning. Kill anything that moves. So Jamie heard this, and he hopped up and, uh, you know, uh, made his way towards uh, where the civilians were and where the captain was. He wanted to intervene. But he arrived just seconds late, just in time to see five men open up on full automatic with their M16s and kill all the civilians there. Jamie watched this happen, and he said that you know, 30 seconds afterwards, he vowed that he'd blow the whistle on it. So when he came home, he went right to an Army lawyer, and he reported it. But the, uh, the lawyer told him to keep, kept, uh, to keep quiet. He said that there were a million ways that the Army could make him disappear. He went to an Army criminal investigator, but this man threatened him. Uh, but he kept at it. He, he went down, and uh, he, he found a civilian lawyer and asked for advice. And this man told him to get some political backing. So he wrote to a couple of congressmen, but neither of them would return his letters. And then he decided to go public. Uh, he spoke out at public forums. He published an article. He held a press conference. He went on the radio. But he just couldn't get any traction. And eventually he gave up. And it was only when I showed up on his doorstep with several phone book size, uh, stacks of records, you know, 40 years later, uh, only then did he know that the Army had conducted a thorough investigation and corroborated everything that he said. Mm. But, of course, that was kept secret from him and from the American public. And what would have been the first story about a Milai-style massacre wasn't fully exposed until 40 years later. And in in many respects, I mean, that is... um or at least uh, in some respects, that is that is the the one of the, the the big takeaways from your book is that the My Lai massacre, uh, which was I think perceived as as a, an aberration in some ways, sort of like what the worst thing that could happen in that context. And uh, but the book essentially outlines and that these there were, if not in the size, but at least. Um, there were, I mean, I don't know, hundreds or, or more of these. I mean, that it was 
in many respects, standard operating procedures. Is that fair? It is. You know, MILAI is atypical basically for two reasons. One, uh, the, the number of civilians killed at one time uh, is, is very large at MILAI. 500 civilians killed over a period of four hours. Most massacres were smaller than this. Uh, but, uh, but otherwise, uh, it isn't atypical. But the other thing that's atypical about it is the fact that it was thoroughly investigated. There has never been uh, another military investigation, at least during the Vietnam War, that was uh, as comprehensive as the investigation to meet Lai. And uh, perhaps the most telling thing about that investigation is the fact that uh, uh, the, the military put a, a, a general named Piers, General Piers, in charge. And, and his Piers panel looked at meet Lai. And as they were looking at it, what they found was at the very same moment that 500 civilians were being killed at Milai, uh, there was a, another hamlet nearby called Mike. Uh, a totally different unit on a different mission went to Mike and killed somewhere between 50 and 150 Vietnamese there. Uh, and, and this was, uh, they figured this out, it was suppressed at the time, and it was never fully made public in a way that Milai was. But the fact that the, the military can look into this and find, you know, on the, on the very same day, two different massacres, two different villages, uh, two different units, it really put the lie to the fact that, uh, that, that, that My Lai was somehow an isolated incident or committed by bad apples. Uh, and, and once the military saw that, they got scared, and this is what caused the Vietnam War Crimes Working Group to be created. They created this task force because they were basically afraid of, of what else might uh, you know, bubble up from Vietnam. And whenever they could, this task force would try and tamp down allegations and make sure that they didn't uh, explode in the press the way Milai did. I mean, that, that, is, that is also one of the, the, the really incredible uh, sort of, I mean, that this, uh, that the, in fact, the, the, the existence of the working group is in some respects uh, proof of, of that premise, that this is not an isolated incident. In fact, that they needed to develop an entire apparatus to essentially maintain a fictional narrative of the, the whole war in many respects. That's exactly right, and I think it's uh, you know that it's one of the major reasons why, as you as you mentioned, there are thirty thousand books on the Vietnam War. Uh, but if you you read most of them, basically when they uh, you know it, if they talk about Vietnamese civilians suffering at all, it's in the context of only My Lai. Uh, so this was a uh, you know a, a real victory on the part of the military. They were able to uh, contain that that you know alternate narrative of the war, and uh, and really reduce it to My Lai. So you have you have this one uh, horrific massacre, but but just one stand in for uh, what was pervasive suffering. What I came to see is a signature aspect of the conflict, uh, and this was a, a conflict that uh, in which millions of Vietnamese were killed, millions more made wounded or uh, made refugees by deliberate U.S. policies, like uh, like the use of almost unrestrained bombing and artillery shelling across wide swaths of the countryside. So we're talking about deliberate policies that were dictated at the highest levels of the military. But from their narrative and the one that we've, we've mostly seen in history books, uh, it's, it's all been collapsed into me lie. I mean, is that, um, I mean, is, is my, is, is that fair to say that that uh, the kill anything that moves was in many respects sort of the overarching policy? I mean, because to me, the, the only parallel that, that uh, I can make is, Sort of how our our torture regime occurred in Iraq was a essentially a, a combination of a deliberate loosening of the standards of 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 what to uh, in terms of orders that were issued down from from the civilian leadership through the uh, top military leadership down to the the, the uh, uh, military personnel in Iraq and then also. A certain amount of improvisation that is taking place on on all levels, going in both directions. Uh, if that makes any sense. Yeah, I, th- I think it's a, a fair assessment. You know, you uh, I, I mentioned that uh, the phrase "kill anything that moves." I first noticed it uh, as as orders handed down during the the massacre that Jamie Henry witnessed, and I realized that uh, you know as I studied the war further, I saw this phrase or variations of it pop up. In various investigations, uh, it was the order that was handed down 
before the My Lai massacre by uh, Captain Medina. He told the men that they were to go in and, and kill anything that moves. I found this, uh, this phrase repeated in a, a court martial documents uh, relating to a, a massacre that, that Marines carried out in 1967. And I, I kept seeing it over and over again. And it really, I began to, to, to take it as a, as a, a dictum, a, a shorthand for how the war was really fought. And, uh, and I, I think that uh, in many respects, it, it was a, a kill anything that moves type of war. The U.S., um, you know, as, as I mentioned, the, the, the top command, and this came down from the Pentagon, came up with policies that made it inevitable that large numbers of, of Vietnamese civilians would be uh, killed or wounded during the war. You know, we'll never know exactly how many Vietnamese civilians died, but the best estimates we have indicate that there were 2 million civilian dead. Add to that about 5.3 million civilian wounded. Uh, the U.S. government came up with its estimate of 11 million Vietnamese-made refugees. The latest study showed that as many as 4 million Vietnamese were exposed to toxic defoliants like Agent Orange. So you have suffering on an almost unimaginable scale. And, uh, and it, the, the military high command and, and even the White House uh, you know, just had to know that this was going on. It was impossible not to, to see it from, from their vantage point. I mean the uh, the war having a war crimes working group. I mean it seems to me would be um, uh, you know the the first piece of evidence on some level because it's 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 set up not to figure out how can we prevent this. It's essentially set up to figure out how can we continue uh, to maintain this sort of broader policy without it having any type of implications in terms of accountability and in terms of of, uh, you know, providing any type of informed consent, I guess. I mean, I don't know how else to say it, uh, to the American people as to what, what was actually going on at the time. That's right. The, uh, the War Crimes Working Group never worked to prevent war crimes, to prosecute war crimes, to put guidance out into the field. Uh, this strictly was for uh, tracking purposes, to keep the White House appraised, to keep the Secretary of Defense appraised, and to make sure that whenever it was possible, that they could uh, bury investigations the way they did, uh, you know, Jamie Henry's investigation. I mean, do you do you think that the I mean, the the strategy that we were pursuing in Vietnam was essentially an attrition strategy? Tell us about that and how you think that that may have sort of, uh, I mean, it almost included in the description the the title of the strategy. I mean, uh, speaks in some respects to uh, what it led to. But but just tell us a little bit about the attrition strategy. Sure. You know, the, the war was fought, uh, you know, this wasn't a, a classic uh, World War I type of war where you had two armies facing off a, across a battlefield trying to take territory and eventually an enemy capital. Uh, the Vietnamese uh, uh, revolutionaries were fighting a guerrilla conflict. Uh, they weren't trying to, to take territory, nor were the Americans. Uh, so the, the Americans were looking for, you know, some sort of metric to prove that they were winning. And they seized on one that they'd used during the second half of the Korean War which was uh, you know, the, the attrition strategy and the use of body count. And the basic idea is that the, uh, that the U.S. would kill its way to victory and reach this, uh, this mythic crossover point that, that the Americans were always chasing. The idea was that you'd be killing more uh, guerrillas than the enemy could put into the field. And at that point, the enemy would assess the war in a rational way and decide to, uh, to abandon it. They'd see that they were, were losing and, and make a rational decision. Of course, the, the Vietnamese saw this as a, a nationalist uh, struggle, uh, a revolution, and a continuation of their anti-colonial fight against the French, uh, who the U.S. had backed during the 1950s. So they weren't looking at it as a, as a ledger sheet of, of credits and debits. Uh, but the, uh, the Americans never uh, saw it a, a, a different way. They just couldn't conceptualize the way the Vietnamese saw the war. And, uh, and they basically only had one option uh, uh, to exercise. Uh, to continue the attrition strategy, and that was to uh, apply more and more firepower on the countryside in an effort to, uh, you know, break the the hold between the uh, the guerrillas and the uh, the peasant population, uh, to drive the, uh, the the Vietnamese from the countryside and and uh, and isolate the guerrillas. Uh, and on the ground, this really had disastrous consequences for uh, for the Vietnamese uh, civilian population. Uh, because of one of the firepower raining down, and also American troops on the ground learned very quickly that uh, that their commanders weren't discerning about what types of bodies they just wanted Vietnamese bodies. So 
So they could, uh, as in the case at, uh, at My Lai, claim they'd killed 128 enemy troops at a cost of no American lives with uh, only a handful of weapons to, to show for it. You were supposed to turn in your weapons uh, to, to show the, the body count was accurate. But, uh, but American commanders weren't discerning about that. So uh, the American troops learned that, that any bodies would do, and they could shoot first because no one would ask questions after. I, I mean, it, 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 that aspect of it, um, uh, you know... I mean, uh, trying to sort of uh, you, you divorce yourself on some level from the and, and and part of the process, I guess, is completely divorcing yourself to execute that type of strategy. You're completely divorcing yourself from uh, the implications of humanity. But it is a real sort of, and I guess you know, uh, it was it was in many respects you know, sort of McNamara's corporatization of 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 war in some way, and it's it, it's that sort of same corporatization, frankly, that we see, uh, you know in a lot of domestic policies frankly that that look at just simply numbers and but this is the most extreme case of it where you're completely stripping away the humanity and i think uh, the, you, you've described it or it's been described as you know stacking bodies like you would uh, a stack of logs essentially that's that's exactly right you know bob mcnamara had uh, in in the decades a decade before he became secretary of defense uh, headed for motor company and he really thought that he could run the Pentagon and, and basically run the Vietnam War the same way that he'd run Ford, just as a business. Uh, he brought in technocrats. He brought in uh, a lot of computers. They crunched numbers. And, and he really thought that uh, he, could, he could win the war this way. But he never had any other uh, solution. You know, when, when he saw that they weren't winning, the only, uh, the only option available was to just increase the firepower. And as I said, it was, uh, it was a nightmare for Vietnamese civilians. Let's talk about some of the uh, other stories of individuals. I mean, imagine, I mean, uh, in, in you, you traveled to Vietnam, you spoke to, to uh, victims of this war, you spoke to um, uh, soldiers who um, committed these atrocities, to uh, uh, ranking uh, uh, military personnel who may have, I guess, ordered. Uh, but w- what was the reaction? I mean, as you went to these interviews with this information, um, were, were the, were the reactions, uh, I mean, uh, dissimilar, uh, how did they relate relative to the, the, the story of, 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 the medic? I mean, I imagine that medic felt some type of indication that finally, um, you know, a, a mission that he had been on that he had, he had given up because of it just was failing in terms of, uh, exposing these things, um, and the systemic nature of them. How, d- how did other people react? Well, um, among American veterans, as, as you might imagine, there was a full spectrum of responses. Uh, there were some, some individuals I talked to. Uh, you know, I got in touch with a, a, a man who I knew from records had, uh, had admitted to uh, carrying out acts of torture on, uh, on enemy prisoners and civilian detainees using uh, electrical torture and uh, water torture, what, what we refer now to as, as waterboarding. And I got in touch with him, and I, I asked him about this, and, and he was completely unrepentant. He told me that, uh, you know, he thought what he'd done was right. If he was in a Vietnam-type situation again, he would do the exact same thing. He thought it was uh, the right thing to do for the war effort, and uh, he saw nothing wrong with, with uh, how he carried out the war. And, of course, there were, there were other uh, soldiers that I, or veterans that I talked to who uh, you know, had a very different reaction. There's one who, uh, he really sticks out in my mind. You know, I, I talked to him for uh, you know, several hours. He was uh, very jovial. He had an infectious laugh. We talked about a lot of different aspects of the war. And, uh, and he got quiet, and he told me he wanted to tell me about uh, a, a member of his unit. And he talked about how they went into a village, and they were setting it on fire, burning it down, which was basically standard, standard operating procedure. This was another way that... Uh, the Americans sought to, to break uh, the connection between the guerrillas and the, the peasants in the countryside. So they were burning down a village, and, uh, and a, a woman came up and, and grabbed this, uh, this other soldier, this GI, by the arm and was yelling at him. You know, obviously, she was yelling about her home being burned down, all her possessions being burnt up. And he said that the, uh, the GI pushed her away, and then he took his rifle and hit her squarely in the nose with the butt of his rifle. And broke her nose. There was blood everywhere. She was screaming, and the uh, this GI just turned around and, and walked away laughing. 
And the man who was telling me the story then got got very quiet, and he said, um, you know, a couple moments later, you know that the, the GI in that story was me. And I, I really had a tough time, you know, connecting up the man that I was talking to uh, to the one from the story, and he told me that, that he had a very hard time uh, believing what his 19-year-old self had done. He couldn't imagine how he had broken this woman's nose and walked away laughing and how he had done you know, other things in, in Vietnam that he wasn't proud of. And he said that uh, you know, at the time, he didn't really think anything of it. But uh, in the years since, he couldn't help but think of it uh, on a regular basis, that this had really stayed with him. And it was something that he grappled with uh, you know, his, his entire life. And, and for many of the veterans that I talked to, uh, this, this was the case. You know, they were a little more than boys when they were sent to Vietnam, and, uh, and, and they've, been, they've been living with the, the consequences ever since. Were any of these people that you, um, these former uh, uh, soldiers that you had tracked down via the uh, the documents that you found, were they aware that their actions had been investigated? I mean, were they brought in and interviewed uh, contemporaneously uh, or at any time? Uh, how, you know, how did the uh, the atrocities working group? Um, how did they, uh, I guess, uh, acquire their rep- uh, the information in their reports? Well, these were uh, the the records are basically the sworn testimony of uh, of recently returned uh, American veterans or even at the time active duty soldiers. So most of these men did remember that they had been interviewed, but uh, of course, forty years had passed. The, most of them had never heard anything more of it, uh, and you know there, there was one one uh, veteran that I talked to. He told me that, uh, you know, he had he had talked with, uh, you know, a, a therapist a, about his, uh, you know, what what he had been through in Vietnam, and and he had told this uh, this therapist. He said, you know, I know that somewhere there are records, uh, but he said I I don't know how, you know, where where they're squirreled away, you know. So uh, these men knew that uh, that that records existed, but they had no no idea how to uh, how to get them. Other people thought that they'd just been you know destroyed in the time since. Uh, you know, Jamie Henry, uh, the medic who I mentioned who, who witnessed the massacre. You know, he had no idea that the army had uh, had corroborated everything that he said. And he he felt uh, exceptionally vindicated when I showed him these records and showed that uh, you know dozens of other men from his unit had had finally spoken up and and they'd given sworn testimony. Uh, attesting to the the very same things that, that Jamie had seen, uh, but uh, but but he had no idea that these these records were were, were out there to be found. You know, he had just uh, you know, he'd, he'd moved on with his life and and given up any hope of of ever exposing what had happened. And and the 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 victims or the the witness to atrocities that you found uh, in in Vietnam. I mean, what. How are they processing the other end of of that story, uh, or of these specific you know incident uh, incidences? Sure, I uh, you know I went to Vietnam with these stacks of documents in hand. I was looking for witnesses and survivors who could fill in the, the Vietnamese side of the story, and and uh, and you know like explain what it was like from their point of view. But when I went to Vietnam and I'd asked them about this one specific spasm of violence what I heard over and over again from the Vietnamese was what it was like to live for 10 years under bombs and shells and helicopter gunships about how they had to negotiate every aspect of their life around the, the American war, what it was like to try and figure out when to uh, dash out of your, your bunker to try and uh, get some water or forage for food or, or relieve yourself. All these, just the, the day to day of the, of their lives and how they had to, uh, uh, negotiate every aspect around the American war. And very quickly, I, I, I came to understand that this was really the story of the war, that the, the records that I had, the American testimony, it helped to punctuate it, it helped to fill in the gaps. But, uh, but was really what was missing from the Vietnam literature was uh, this, this uh, Vietnamese civilian side of the war. Uh, and and quickly that that transformed my project, and it it, it made uh, kill anything that moves a, a very different book than it, it would have been otherwise. And 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 that is also I think the the parts that's the most instructive in terms of the implications because we can look at uh, Iraq and you know f- as far as uh, 
the uh, American body politic and the American consciousness is, well, that war is over and, uh, uh, you know, wipe our hands of it and it's all done. And uh, frankly, I think people, you know, felt that way a couple of years ago. You know, it was just all but for the, the formalities of leaving, yet the implications in the state of war uh, continue there in many respects. Yeah, and and you know, as I was writing this book, of course, I was I was looking at the uh, the, the current wars, and I I thought that there was, um, you know, there there were some uh, real parallels there. Uh, you know, since since America is constantly involved in uh, military conflicts abroad, uh, in Af- Afghanistan, Iraq, Pakistan, Libya, Yemen, Somalia, these last years, uh, I I really thought it was important uh, to do my best to try and show. Uh, you know what war is really like. I think I think it's important that Americans Americans understand, uh, you know, what war is like, especially for the people who live with it every day, and that's civilians. You know, wars cause uh, uh, you know our, our wars cause immense suffering, but the uh, the stories of civilians affected by America's wars rarely make the front pages of the newspapers or lead the nightly news. And I think that if uh, Americans are called upon to send their uh, sons and daughters to war, they ought to have a clear idea of what it means for the sons and daughters of people overseas. I mean, to the extent that the that the uh, your book sort of exposes that uh, My Lai was not uh, an isolated incident, that it was um, a an example of really what what was the character and the nature of the war that we were waging. Uh, on this country, in many respects, is is that is that that analogy in that uh, Milai is not uh, such a um, uh, isolated event? Is that analogy can that be made in terms of, and it maybe to extent you you, you just did made that an, uh, analogy that uh, Vietnam was also not so special relative to the implications of war wherever we go. I mean, you know, like you say, I mean in Iraq we by our own conservative estimates, killed well over 100,000 civilians, and that's probably significantly on the low end. By our own estimates, uh, 4 million refugees, two uh, that had to leave the country, two within the country. Um, And, uh, I mean, in some sense, is there a an attempt by both our government, and because I think our government has clearly learned the lessons that they learned from Vietnam were found more or as much in the establishment of that uh, atrocities working group as anything else. That, you know, the, the lesson they're going to learn is that you really have to keep this information from the American public. Uh, I mean, that was one of the things that they, they clearly learned. But uh, is your book expose that notion that, in, that Vietnam was not a different war. It was maybe different in terms of the the size, uh, but in terms of the implications and what it does to the the civilian population, at the very least, is is very much uh, consistent with all our wars. Well, you know, I, I have studied today's wars, and I, I have to say that I don't think the the uh, killing of civilians by U.S. forces today is uh, is near the scale of the carnage uh, in Vietnam. You know, specifically the ways that artillery and air power are used, uh, at least uh, from, from what I've seen, are, are radically different. But that said, uh, you know, and as you mentioned, you know, civilians still die on a regular basis in our war zones, be it Iraq or Afghanistan, many due to the violence set off by America's invasions and occupations and the resulting civil strife. And, uh, and of course, others have been killed directly by U.S. bombing, from helicopter gunships, and from troops on the ground. And still more have been wounded, and others have been made refugees, and, uh, and despite the, uh, the best efforts of the, the United Nations and other NGOs, uh, we really don't have good numbers on the civilian toll. But, but we know that there's been immense suffering. And if history is any guide, uh, it might be decades before someone is able to put together the full story of, of these wars, let alone the, uh, the semi-covert campaigns in, in places like Pakistan and Yemen. So I think, uh, I, I think it, it, it might be some time before we're able to... Uh, to really say, you know, exactly what, uh, what, what toll these wars have taken on civilians. Do you think that, and lastly, do you think it's uh, that had f- by whatever, I mean, obviously, uh, you know, age in and of itself would have been, uh, would have precluded you, but had it been possible 
or had anyone been able to, 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 to write this book closer to the conflict in terms of time? You know, you write the book uh, nearly 30 years, well, 30 years plus, um, 40 years uh, plus from the end of the, of, the, of the conflict. Had someone been able to write that book earlier, do you think that there would have been, the, your book earlier, do you think that the, we would have learned more, I mean, that it would have affected the trajectory of our, um, our war making? Well, of, of course, it's, it's always uh, it's always hard to say with these things. But I, I did talk to uh, uh, one of the, the colonels. He, he retired as a general who worked on the Vietnam War Crimes Working Group, and he was one of the men who kept this uh, these files secret. And you know, I, I I went to him and I I talked to him about it, and he told me that at the time he thought it was the the right thing to do. He thought it was for the the good of the the war effort, for the good of the country. But in the years since, uh, he came to see it as a, as a major mistake and a, and a huge failing on his part. You know, I was interviewing him while the Iraq war was, was still raging. And, uh, and, he, and he said to me, you know, if, if these had been made public at the time, he didn't think that uh, there would have been the, uh, the Abu Ghraib torture scandal. He thought if, uh, if, if these records had had an airing uh, during or even directly after the Vietnam War, that it would have caused a major reevaluation within the Pentagon and uh, and maybe the, the the current atrocity scandals uh, could have been avoided. So, you know, someone who who saw things from the inside definitely thought that was the case. Nick Terse, author of Kill Anything That Moves: The Real American War in Vietnam. Thanks so much uh, for your time today. And uh, we obviously have a link up uh, uh, to your book at uh, Majority FM. Thanks uh, very much, and and really congratulations on writing what is a, a really incredibly uh, important book. I think. Thank you. I really appreciate you having me on.